So to introduce our next unit, which is unit three, we're going to start with Luce Irigare, and her paper is called This Sex, Which Is Not One. Now when you were first reading this, it might have seemed a, seemed a little weird to you. Um, that's partly because, as you probably learned, she's a French feminist philosopher, so it's been translated, and her writing is also very poetic and sort of esoteric. So before we start going into Irigaray's theory, first I want to let you know that she is equivocating female and woman. So by equivocate, I mean she's using them interchangeably, even though what we've learned in the gender section, female refers to the sex usually and woman refers to gender. So why is Irigaray doing this? Possibly it's for effect. Um, and I would be interested to hear what some of you guys think about this and maybe your discussion posts or anything like that. But what she's doing here in this paper is she's highlighting sex differences. So she's saying there's something inherently valuable about the fact that women are different. And this is much different than other feminist works that want to highlight sameness for the sake of equality. So a question that comes up is, what's the best political strategy? Is it sameness or is it difference? Now, women's sexuality and female genitalia are often looked at in opposition to male genitalia. So you can see in like this diagram, for instance, this is actually, even though it looks just like a diagram of a penis, it's actually of a woman's vagina and what was thought a woman's vagina consisted in or women's genitalia consisted in. And here's another diagram again. I mean, it's really shocking how much it looks like a penis because a lot of the people drawing these diagrams in the Middle Ages and in, in like the 1800s when this one was drawn, um, it was done by men, right? So this is a sense in which women's vaginas and uteruses and reproductive organs overall were sort of seen as inverted or underdeveloped penises. Furthermore, Vaginas are considered sheaths or vessels which hold the penis, just like how we often hear that women's uteruses are considered vessels for a fetus and nothing more. In all these considerations about women's genitalia, the penis is central to understanding what female genitalia should be or do. So it's not only androcentric, but it's also heteronormative. So Irigaray is trying to look at women's eroticism outside of this androcentric or heteronormative picture. So ultimately what she's trying to argue is that female eroticism consists of a complexity not captured by male-centered sexual pleasure. Therefore, it's both wrong and too simplistic to talk about female sexuality in terms of this andro and heterocentric ideal. So what does she mean by not one? She's using specific imagery of labia here. She says that the two lips are always touching and furthermore, she says that they're violently separated by the penetration of a penis. But the two lips aren't two independent entities, but are two parts of a unified set of sorts. So she's both touching and being touched by herself. So this is where we get her sense of autoeroticism. So she's neither one nor two in this sense. So why is this threatening? A, because it signifies that the man is not needed. So autoeroticism is juxtaposed against heteroeroticism. In response to the threat of female eroticism, phallocentric culture emerges. So Irigare gives examples of this through the representation of the vagina as a crack or a hole or an absence. And also we see this in the objectification of women, which comes out of the rejection of feeling. So she says that feeling is inherently female. It's represented by the feeling of the lips versus seeing, which is inherently male. So it's represented by the sight of the phallus. So what's the result of androcentric or phallocentric thinking? The woman has no pleasure of her own. So her pleasure is only in terms of how she pleases a man. As a side note, we see this on an extreme level with women in the U.S. today getting cosmetic surgery to remove the labia. This is called labiaplasty. So the woman loses touch with herself literally because she's being penetrated and her lips are separated by a penis. So because she can't be defined phallocentrically, and remember, she isn't one because she has two lips, but she's not two because she's a unity. Therefore, she's counted as none. We see this when women are considered vessels or voids. So what's going on with a woman's sexual pleasure? It's not dependent on the phallus, according to Irigaray. Her sexual pleasure doesn't involve 
just one type of sexual activity. So what is she doing here? She's kind of implying that male pleasure does involve one type of activity. So having the penis enveloped by something or in some way. Now let's look at difference here. So because a woman is not one, it makes sense that she's considered hysterical, unstable, or incomprehensible, right? Because she's a multiplicity. So she's saying here that there's something about the erotic experience of a woman with her own genitalia that correlates with her behavior and how it's been policed historically. So because she's autoerotic and her genitalia is complex, the androcentric fear of this leads to the ways we classify women as hysterical. So remember, hyster is the Latin root meaning womb. So hysteria comes from an old diagnosis of female psychosis that results from some defect or condition in the uterus or womb. And you can see in this picture, this doctor is healing this woman of hysteria. So because a woman is not one, she's always dual and has dual meaning. They're always thinking of nothing and everything at the same time according to Arigare. And this is because she's self-fulfilling. So she's everything to herself and nothing else or extra is there besides her. Furthermore, this makes her multiplicitous. But the duality and multiplicity is still unified and can't be separated or compartmentalized. So it's sort of like how we've talked about race and gender identities. You can't separate your identities because they all sort of overlap and relate to each other, kind of like a web. But women are splintered by phallocentric society, leading to a debilitation of women's psyches. So then this is going to lead to the positive part of Eric Ray's paper. So the point of all of this is trying to recuperate the female self. So we do this by tuning into one's duality, multiplicity, or unity. And this is where power comes for women. So this comes by a rejection of the androcentric, phallocentric ways of thinking. So Arigare is calling for us to stop thinking within phallocentric parameters and place female sexuality at the center. And this isn't as negative as you think it might be. Everyone benefits because putting women at the center is an expansion. So it's inclusive of male eroticism. It doesn't have to be one or the other, according to Arigare. This may seem sort of hard to imagine for us, but that's probably because we're trained to think of this or that or to think of either or and not and. And Arigare wants us to stop thinking of the either or and start thinking of the and. So that's it for Arigare. Now you're going to go on and move to the next reading. So that's it for Arigare. Now you're going to go on and move... So that's it for Arigare. In case you're still wondering about this essay, because it's, like I said, a little weird, a little poetic, the wording is not what we're used to, um, I would recommend that you go back and, again, discuss some of this stuff on discussion forums and try to work through this stuff together. Because I know when I was introduced to a rigore many, many years ago, I was super confused by it, and I actually hated this essay. If you do have this under your belt, though, go ahead and move on to the next piece.